Happy Sabbath, everyone. On behalf of Loma of the Korean Church, we're glad you can join us for this live streaming worship. It has been a wonderful, wonderful to have this opportunity to join. Unfortunately, I can't see all of you. You can only see me, but I think we'll have a day when we get together, have a normal worship again soon. The past Six, seven months has been very difficult for all of us. Uh, we had lockdown, we had restriction, people losing job, people are getting sick from the illness that we are encountering with this COVID. Kids are not able to go out and play, be with their friends. I have a three-year-old granddaughter. She's not able to get out and join her friends and go do things because of risk of spreading the COVID virus, so they say. Parents are having a difficult time because they're not used to having kids around the clock at home. And of course, they're not able to work as well. And I see people losing job. Uh, I see grandparents are having difficult times. Many of us have not gotten sick, but we're not able to attend the church like normally we did. We're not able to get together normally we did. We're not able to attend Bible study like we used to do. But instead of thinking negative things, yes, all those things happened in the last six, seven months. But personally, my wife and I, we felt that we gotten closer individually to God because we were spending more time studying the words, figuring out what do I need to do now? What else can I do to be better myself for the kingdom of God? I'm definitely guilty of myself as a professional going through medical school, working, thinking that I spent a lot of time going to church. During my medical school, I don't think I missed a single Sabbath going to church. But was that enough? We think it is but we spend so much more time creating other gods in our life. Don't you think God feels really sad when he sees that in us? So as you will worship today, let's truly open our hearts, embrace the spirit so we can go out and spread the good news while we can for the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, happy Sabbath everyone. Hello boys and girls and happy Sabbath. I hope you had a really great week and I hope that you are just as happy as I am that today is Sabbath and that we have a chance to rest and relax today. I also know that a lot of you have Thanksgiving break coming up this week, so I hope you have a really great week spending time with your family, eating delicious food, taking a break from just everything that's happening right now, and most of all, remembering to be thankful for everything that you have. So before you start your Thanksgiving break, I wanted us all to do a quick math lesson together. What do you think? I'm just kidding, we're not really doing a math lesson together, but I do want you to take a look at what is written on my paper. I have two kinds of math problems. I have an addition problem and I have a subtraction problem. Now these are concepts that we all learn really early on when we first start school, right? But 
guess what? I'm here to tell you something. You, my friends, already knew how to add and subtract even before you ever stepped foot into the classroom. It's true. You already knew what addition and subtraction was because basically, what does addition mean? It means that you are putting more things in, and subtraction means that you are taking things away. And these are concepts that even our youngest children learn at a really, really early age. Now, when we are really little, adding more things in seems like the most fun thing ever, doesn't it? You get to add more toys, you get to add more books, you get to add more snacks, you get to add more supplies. You just add a whole lot of everything into your life, into your collection, and it's so exciting because you see all of these things start to grow and grow and grow. For my younger friends, I want you to think about the toy collections that you have in your house right now. So if you open up your toy drawers or your closets, I know that a lot of you have a whole lot of everything, right? A lot of cars, trucks, dolls, stuffed animals, Legos, just a whole collection of everything. We like to collect a lot of things lately, don't we? But what happens as you keep on adding things into your collection? Oftentimes, the things that you really, really loved and always enjoyed playing with get forgotten because they get pushed to the back of the closet, maybe to the very bottom of your toy drawer, to the very, very back of any toy box that you have because you keep on adding more and more things on top of it. And we often forget that we already had such special things that we really, really enjoyed until we discover it much, much later when we finally start to clean out all of our things. And this is also the same. If you add too many activities to your to-do list that day, it's really, really hard to get finished and to finish everything in one day. And then we often get upset or angry or stressed out because we can't get everything done. So in cases like that, putting more things in or adding isn't always the happiest thing for us. So with the holidays coming up, my friends, I have a challenge for you. You know me, even in Sabbath school, I love to give you challenges all the time. So my challenge for you this holiday season is instead of only thinking about all the adding you want to do, why don't we think about some of the subtraction that we can do in our lives right now? So some of the things that you can do is with the grown up, maybe go through your collection, maybe find one or two things that you want to donate to a friend, a family, a neighbor, an organization, or a charity that you can give these things to where people can enjoy these new toys, perhaps new books, go through your clothes and your blankets and all of that stuff and find somebody to give it to that they can enjoy. And as you are doing that, you are subtracting things out of your own collection and giving it and making it brand new for somebody else, which would make them so happy and at the same time make you so happy because your room might be getting a lot cleaner, your toy bins might be getting a lot cleaner, or you might find a special toy that you had forgotten all about that you loved at one point and now you can have so much fun playing with again. Boys and girls, what I want you to remember is that adding is not always the best thing. Sometimes subtracting things or taking things out of your life might be the thing that makes you the happiest of all. Now is subtracting really easy? Of course it's not. It's not easy for you. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for a lot of people. Letting things go, giving things away, taking things out of our house and out of our life is not always the easiest thing. But I'm not asking you to take everything out of your life, right? I'm just asking you to take some time and think about what really makes you happy and what maybe doesn't make you as happy. And maybe it's time to subtract and take some things out. Or maybe they're not things that don't necessarily make you unhappy, but maybe just things that you no longer need anymore. And maybe it's time to pass them on to somebody who it would bring happiness to. So that's what I want us to think about this holiday season. And boys and girls, I can pretty much guarantee that as you start subtracting some things in your life, you might find a whole lot of happiness being added in for you.
So with that, I wish you all the best with your subtraction challenge, and I cannot wait to have, hear the stories that you will have to share with me in Sabbath School. Now, speaking of Sabbath School, I do have a really quick announcement about it. This coming Tuesday, November 24th, is the next round of supply bag pickups. If your name is still not on our supply bag list and you would like to join us for Sabbath School, go ahead and contact me so I can get a bag ready for you. All right, then have a happy Sabbath.
but it is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Today's scripture reading is found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you are taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us to another week. Please be with us during this worship, and especially with Pastor Juni as she delivers your message. We pray that you bring comfort and peace to anyone in suffering during this time. And help us to see, despite all this, there are many things to be thankful for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. In 1863, in the middle of a raging civil war in our country, President Abraham Lincoln made Thanksgiving a federal holiday. He declared that the last Thursday of every November would be a day set aside by all Americans to give thanks. And it's really interesting because in his declaration, he specifically mentions who he intends the nation to give thanks to. He said, I invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are away in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwells in the heavens. He also invites the citizens of the nation to pray for the widows, the orphans, those who are mourning, those who are suffering in the Civil War, and to acknowledge and repent and to fervently seek the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it to peace, harmony, tranquility, and unity. And he ends his declaration by saying that no human council has devised or made these things come to be, but rather they are all gracious gifts from the most high God who does, yes, he hates sin, but who is unendingly merciful to us. I never knew this before. We often learn about the first Thanksgiving um, the gathering of the pilgrims after their first harvest in the new world. But reading the declaration from President Lincoln, you realize that the gratitude that was intended from the beginning of this holiday that is approaching wasn't simply this vague sense of just, yay, I'm thankful I get today off. I'm thankful I get to eat Thanksgiving food. But rather, it was meant to give us intentional and undistracted time to reflect on all that we've been blessed with and to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize God's hand in our lives. So let us acknowledge him right now and start with prayer. Gracious Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to join us. As we gear up in gratitude, may you teach us what that really means and how we can do that. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2020, November 2020, even though our country isn't at literal war, we are in the midst of a pandemic and as polarized as ever. And I wonder if maybe we're meant to take a moment to pause and ask ourselves, how much do we actually give thanks on the actual day of Thanksgiving? Do you and your family, do you share around the table what you're thankful for? Do you take a moment at the beginning or end of the day to express out loud to God your gratitude? Or for you, has this day become a day of even more intense consumption, of overeating until we regret it because it hurts, and then online shopping for Black, early Black Friday deals until we fall asleep from food coma? And when we're constantly consuming, does it make it harder for us to see our blessings, and what we do actually have. The title of this week's message is Gearing Up in Gratitude. What does it mean to gear up? 
It means to prepare or to equip yourself for something, to get ready. I know that our church has a huge biking community now that has really grown over this past year. And guess who the newest convert is? That's right. A friend recently built a bike for me and I'm going to be receiving it this upcoming week, the day before Thanksgiving, and I'm so excited. And because I want to be able to ride it as soon as it arrives, I've been gearing up. I've been preparing. I've been doing research on helmets and bike locks and saddles and lights. I've been reading articles and watching videos on the best way to ride your bike on the road, the safest way to take the lane, so to speak. Because I want to be ready. I want to be prepared. If I were to ask you if you are ready for Thanksgiving, what kind of preparations would come to mind? Turkey, check, cranberries, yes, stuffing, mashed potatoes, pumpkin pie, or the traditional Korean Thanksgiving staples, maybe of kalbi and kimchi? How would you gear up for Thanksgiving normally? Would you make sure that your stretchy pants are washed and ready to go? Would you make sure that your house is clean? Would you make sure that your refrigerator has lots of space for leftovers? But how do we prepare? How do we gear up our hearts to be grateful? What does that look like? God's word tells us this morning in Colossians 2, chapter 2, verse 6, it reads, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. When Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians, he wrote it from a Roman prison, and he was thankful because he saw that God was using his imprisonment to advance the gospel. And one of the commentaries on the book of Colossians says that these two verses here, verse six and seven, are the heart of Paul's letter. And there are three things for us to learn from this morning. The first is to recognize the gift that we have been given. So Paul says, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. You received Jesus. Jesus is the gift of the gospel. And along with the gift of Jesus, it, there comes forgiveness, a new heart, a clean conscience, all those things are true and accurate. But the actual gift itself is Jesus. And this is really important because if we think of blessings as the principal gift of the gospel, then it's a lot, it's, it's a lot more likely that we're going to view the gospel as a contract. What I mean is maybe you would consider it as like, hmm, there's something I need okay, blessings, and God can supply my need through Jesus, so I will give him what he asks for, and in return, he will bless me in the ways I'm looking to be blessed. That's a contract, and then if that is the way that we think about the gospel, then Jesus simply becomes the vehicle through which the blessings I need can be delivered to my life, and that causes a lot of different problems because of what it does to the gospel message. It turns it into a quid pro quo, if I meet the conditions of faith and repentance, then God will fulfill his side of the contract and will pardon me through the cross. And if you have a contractual view of the gospel, you're probably gonna look at God contractually too. Like, okay, I do what he asked me to do, so now he needs to keep his end of the bargain and bless me. But then that's why people fall apart when tragedy occurs, when they have that kind of attitude. It's like, I don't get it. I prayed. I went to church. I'm a good person. I listened to my mom and dad. Why is this happening to me? If I do blank, then he's supposed to do blank. And this distorts our understanding of the gospel. But even worse, it messes with our understanding of Jesus. As in, he just becomes a means to an end. It's like, well, I want forgiveness. And I want blessings. And I want to be in heaven. And he will give me what I need if I give him what he asks of me. So let me just take care of that. And then suddenly Jesus is reduced to a supplier of religious goods and services like a spiritual merchant. And we're just his customers. 
But have you ever seen a customer who serves a retailer? When was the last time you walked into the store and you asked the cashier, hey, can I restock the aisles for you? Can I mop the floors and clean the bathrooms? When you go to Stater Brothers or Trader Joe's or Vons, do you serve those markets? Are you like, oh, wait, no, 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 no. Let me check this customer out. I mean, maybe you do self-checkout and you check yourself out, but do you go and offer to restock their aisles? Do you offer to take care of the smudges on the windows? No, you use these markets for your needs because that's what customers do. And if this is how you view the gospel, then you're not going to be living for Jesus. You're going to be using him. And what Paul says is that when you become a Christian, it's not a fulfillment of the contract, but there is no contract. You have received the gift of Jesus. He comes to you, you become his, and he becomes yours. You receive the gift, and recognizing the gift helps you to experience more gratitude. So that's part one. Part two, there is a call. Instead of, hey, if you live this way, then you're going to get these blessings, the gospel says, God will bless you. He has blessed you. He will continue to bless you and has given you the gift of Jesus. Now, here's how you should live. And that's the pattern that you find in verse 6 and 7. So then, just as you received Christ, Jesus as Lord, it says, continue to live your lives in him. Live it out. Put it into action. Then explains how. Rooted and built up in him. Paul uses two metaphors here. One that involves trees and their roots, and the other that involves architecture and building. He implies that your spiritual roots have been sunk deep in Jesus, right? Part of what it means to live your lives in Jesus is to make sure that your roots continue to sink deeply into the rich, fertile soil that is Christ. That implies a source of life and nourishment. It's why trees sink their roots down deeply to receive nutrition, so that when drought conditions strike, that we can be like a tree planted by streams of water. And it also implies security. Why aren't trees uprooted when it's really windy? Because they have deep roots that have sunk securely, and so they're stable and firm. And when trials strike, you're not going to be tossed around because you have security in your roots. It's near impossible to live in Jesus unless you're rooted in him. Right? Do, do you get the difference there? It's not just willing yourself like, I'm going to live in Jesus. How do you do that if you don't have regular, daily access to the Holy Spirit? How do you do that if you're not connected to the vine? Is he your life source? Is your life more nourished and secure when you're grounded in him? And then there's the architect metaphor. We're not only rooted, but we are built up. Okay, so when Paul said that we're rooted, that was past tense because that's what happens as you get to receive Christ, as you accept him as a gift, we become rooted. That's our foundation. But when it talks about being built up, this is no longer past tense, it's present tense, because we are being built up currently, continually. And God, the master builder, is working on us. And sometimes it's a renovation project and it's uncomfortable, or sometimes it's using us to build up parts of the kingdom. And so we're asked to reposition ourselves somewhere else or to strengthen one area. And that's the call that we're asked to engage in after receiving the gift of Jesus, to let our roots go deep, deep into him, and then to make space and time in our day-to-day -day lives to let God build us up in Christ. And both of these metaphors help us to see that this isn't really something we can do on our own. So then again, that points us to recognize, wow, I'm really thankful. It helps us again to gear up a little more in gratitude. And lastly, Paul mentions the tools that we can use. 
rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. We're strengthened in the faith as we were taught, meaning there's importance and there's strength and there's stability in what we're taught. So don't stop learning. Don't stop expanding your understanding of Jesus. Don't stop being in his presence because that's how you're continually built up. That's how your roots go deeper. And the final tool that Paul mentions is the practice of thankfulness, the practice of gratitude. I'll be honest, I don't always feel thankful. Sometimes it's easier to keep thinking about everything that's wrong instead of things that are right. So how do you fight that? How do you fight discontentment and dissatisfaction and a complaining spirit? You practice gratitude. How do you fight weak muscles? You practice strengthening those muscles. I wouldn't know because I have never been like an active member of a gym. I actually got a Drayson membership in February and then Drayson shut down in March. So that didn't really go well, but I hear from those many people around me who were formerly very dedicated to going to the gym that they have different days where they work out different areas of their body, right? So there's like leg day and there's, I don't even know what kind of days there are, chest day? back day, I don't know, but there's different days for the areas of your body and the, the muscle groups that you wanna work out, right? In the same way, you can't actually expect that someone is just born being really good at practicing gratitude. All you need to do is feed like a three-year-old to see that. Does a two-year-old or a three-year-old after you feed them, is it their natural instinct to express gratitude? Or is that something that they practiced? Because as mommy and daddy would say to them after they're done eating, they would say, what do you say? Thank you. You practice doing the things that you're not good at, that you want to get better at, right? And gratitude is an area that we need to practice. You practice seeing what you have in your life that you're thankful for. You look around you and you ask to see your life clearly. God, please give me your perspective so that I can see all the things that I have in my life that fill me with thankfulness. To see the family who loves you, the opportunity to be in grad school when you weren't always sure that you would get in, for the health that you have at this time, for the things that seem so obvious and guaranteed, like the bed you sleep in, or the food that you have in your fridge, or whatever mode of transportation you currently own. And you give thanks for the gift of Jesus and how even when you grieve his heart, he doesn't leave you, but he continues to minister to you. You practice seeing and naming the things in your life that you're grateful for. And as you do this, as you practice this, as you practice not just one single day of gratitude, but as you practice gratitude in your day-to-day -day lives, your hearts will be softened and the fires of gratitude inside of us will be rekindled and they will overtake the discontentment and the dissatisfaction that maybe you were formally feeling. In a study on gratitude specifically conducted at UC Davis, there were randomly assigned participants who were given one of three tasks. Each week, participants kept a short journal. One group briefly described five things they were grateful for that had occurred in the past week. Another five people, they recorded daily hassles from the previous week that made them unhappy. And the neutral group was asked to list five events or circumstances that affected them, but they weren't told whether they need to focus on if it was a positive or negative experience. 10 weeks later, the participants in the gratitude group felt better about their lives as a whole, and they were a full 25% happier than the hassled group. They, rep they reported fewer health complaints, and they exercised an average of 1.5 hours more. Hmm. In a later study, people were asked to write every day about things for which they were grateful. 
Not surprisingly, this daily practice led to greater increases in gratitude than the weekly journal did in the first study. But the results showed another benefit. Participants in the gratitude group also reported offering other people around them with more emotional support or help with a personal problem, indicating that the gratitude exercise increased their goodwill towards others or more technically their pro-social motivation. Over the last few weeks, there's been a lot of news about COVID-19 vaccine trials and developments that are seeing positive results, and that's great news. But did you know that there's also a vaccine for anxiety that every person has access to? It's free for anyone. That vaccine is the practice of gratitude. Gratitude is the antidote to anxiety. And so I invite you, LKC family, not just in this week that's leading up to a national holiday named Thanksgiving, but as people who have received the gift of Christ, let's be a community that regularly practices gearing up in gratitude and seeing not just, not just to practice that and be like, ooh, good job, I did what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, but seeing how that practice, how the strengthening of the gratitude muscles, how that will change you, how it will shift your heart, how it will give you more patience for others, how it will help you to experience more joy, how it will give you more compassion for the people around you, and how it will allow you to be more deeply rooted in Jesus and to be continued to build, be built up by Him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, may we practice gratitude in the way that you desire for us to. May we experience thankfulness and may we experience seeing things for what they really are, not, not just what we have maybe taken for granted. God, as we lead up to the day of Thanksgiving, help this to not just be one event, but a regular practice in all of our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.